YouTube, what is up? James, MTG Big E here. And it has been a long while since I've made a video, even longer since I made a video talking about modern as a format. And today I wanted to bring a deck tech to you about the modern death and taxes build I am currently playing that I've been doing very well with lately. Um, over the past three local events that I've played in with the deck, I have either won at first place or came in second place. And so I'm starting to grind with this deck and with the upcoming qualifiers, now that the Pro Tour is returning, in Florida at least, there's a lot of modern qualifiers. So I am putting in more work with the deck and tuning it every single day and trying to get to a place where I feel comfortable and confident in the deck. And I think I'm very close. Um, the deck feels very good. So as you can see here, it is an 80 card Yorian build of Death and Taxes. Um, I know some people really, really swear against the 80 card builds because they're worried about the consistency of having 20 more cards in your deck, seeing the important pieces less over the course of a game. And I was like that at first um, in Legacy as well as Modern. But I can definitely say that after putting in a lot of matches with this deck, that the 80 card, um, like the discrepancy between the consistency of 80 cards and 60 cards is not bad at all. And the way you mitigate that inconsistency is by playing mostly four ofs. You have very few flex slots. The only flex slots that you really have to play around with are either cards that are additional copies or very similar to other cards in the deck. So you get like copy number five, six, seven of certain cards or they are cards that can be tutored out of your deck by way of Urza Saga and Stoneforge Mystic. Um, beyond that, you're playing four of, so you do consistently draw the cards that you need, and we get to grind better than any deck in the format, and I can say that confidently. This deck matches up very well against any mid-range or control deck that is meant to grind and prolong the game. Um, it is the sort of deck that the longer the game goes, the more threats that we have usually than the other grindy decks in the format. So we eventually run the control decks and the mid-range decks out of removal and out of answers and eventually get over the top and win the game um, just because we are very threat dense. Now, speaking of those threats, we'll go through the creatures. Um, Yorian, Sky Nomad, is obviously our companion. And then we'll go in mana curve order. We are playing four Giver of Runes. This is the modern version of Mother of Runes. It is very important to the deck to be able to protect our threats and have things to do on turn one. The old Death and Taxes decks in modern never had a good one drop. Uh, outside of Aether Vial, and now we do. Um, additionally, with one drops, we are playing four Esper Sentinels. This is a very powerful draw engine that if you land it on turn one in a lot of matchups, it's going to net you two to three cards oftentimes, or it just swallows up removal. It is a lightning rod for the lightning bolts and holy heats, fatal pushes, uh, prismatic endings, all of the removal in the format, they always try to kill this thing immediately. And a lot of the times when they do, they draw you a card in the process, so it does tend to replace itself often. And when it doesn't replace itself, they're spending more mana that turn, so we are still getting a tax effect. And they are spending a card to take out our one drop, which is a good place to be in. Then moving into two drops, we have the card that has been the kind of reason to play Death and Taxes throughout the years. That's four of Thalia, Guardian of Thraben. Um, again, this card is necessary, especially in conjunction. If we curve from Esper Sentinel into Thalia, then it slows down all of their removal and almost guarantees that we're going to get to draw a card off of the Esper Sentinel. 
So Thalia, still very important. If you're playing Death and Taxes, you're playing four of Thalia, basically, no matter what format and no matter what your deck looks like. Then in the two drop slots still, we have four Stoneforge Mystics. Um, this card being unbanned in Modern at first, it was underwhelming, but now that they've printed some more really crucial equipments for this card, and now that it's like it has given us the ability to actually close games out. Um, so Stoneforge, very important. In the 80 card builds, you're not going to see anything like Leonin Arbiter. So Stoneforge, we get to play without having to worry about the awkwardness of searching. Um, and then we have a three of here, and that is Charming Prince. Um, this card allows us to grind really, really hard with Yorian. When we get the Exile triggers late in the game, um, if we have one of these in play and we get to cast a Yorian or violin a Yorian, um, we can put the Yorian in, blink the Charming Prince, bring the Charming Prince back on the end step, blink the Yorian, and repeat, rinse and repeat, and get a bunch of Yorian triggers on every end step. I've actually played games where I was playing against like Enchantress and they had Sphere of Safety, two of them out. And I was able to, with Charming Prince, a Flicker Wisp, a Skyclave Apparition, and Yorian, every single turn, just start exiling their enchantments um, until I could pay for the Sphere of Safeties. That doesn't happen every game. A lot of times early in the game, this comes down and you just end up scrying two to set up your draws further. That's the mode that most often is used if we're not blinking. And then there are matchups like burn and aggro matchups where just gaining the three life on this guy is very, very critical and helps us get through quite a bit of damage and prolong those aggro matchups till we can win. It is only a three of, it was previously a four of. I had to shave a card to make room for a card that you'll see later. And this on its own without help is one of the weaker creatures. It is the weakest of the two drops for sure. And it is one of the least impactful creatures on an empty board. So to make space, I did shave one we're on three of. And then we have a one of Lion Sash. This card has been overperforming. Um, for those who don't know, this is from Kamigawa Neon Destiny. It is a two drop for one and a white. It is an artifact creature equipment cat. So lots and lots of words on that type line. Um, basically, it is an equipment that we are able to get with Stoneforge Mystic and tutor up and put into our hand. It is main deck graveyard hate because it has the ability of pay one white, exile a target card from a graveyard. If that card was a permanent card, you put a plus one, plus one counter on Lion Sash, and Lion Sash itself comes in as a one, one, and then it has the ability to equip to another creature for two mana, and then the equipped creature gets plus one, plus one for each one, one counter on it. So it gets big itself, or it makes another thing big. It's also graveyard hate. It's tutorable with Stoneforge. So oftentimes we get tutored up with Stoneforge if we're a little threat light, and then we could either put it in with Stoneforge or put it in with Aether Vial. It's a really versatile one of, and it, I'm happy to have it in the deck. It gives the deck another, the, another way to attack and the ability to fight through some graveyard shenanigans in game one, which we previously did not really have. And then we'll move on to three drops. We are working with a three of Archon of Emeria. Um, this is a three of. Uh, this card is incredible when it's good. In the matchups that we have it for, it is almost game breaking. Um, we have this card basically to slow down decks like the Cascade decks, the Rhinos deck, uh, because when each player can only cast one spell per turn, your opponent can't Cascade into anything. It also basically by itself shuts down any storm variant and it has a good body, a two, three flyer for three. Um, the only reason it is not a four of is because it doesn't have any blink synergies with Yorian. So it's essentially here for the matchups where we need it. And um, spoiler alert to the sideboard, I play the fourth of in the sideboard for the matchups where we want it more. Um, 
like the Rhinos matchup, like the like combo matchups in general, and any matchup where we're trying to slow our opponent down. It's even really good against burn. Just slowing burn spells down works very well. So we have a three of there. And then we have the classic death and taxes piece of Flicker Wisp as a four of. This is a solid four of um, because we're trying to blink things with Yorian and Charming Prince, and we have a lot of enter the battlefield synergies in our deck. We have this so we can keep that train rolling. Um, we unfortunately in modern don't have a way to tutor our creatures in mono white. So we want to play four ofs. The legacy deck gets to trim on Flicker Wisp a little bit and play three of, but we want the solid four here just blinking our Charming Princes, our Skyclave Apparitions, our Yorians, anything that has an enter the battlefield, Stoneforge Mystic to get more value there. This card provides a ton of value. If you are familiar with any Death and Taxes build from the beginning of the deck archetype, this card has been basically a part of it. So we're playing a solid four of there. And then we are playing the full suite of four Skyclave Apparitions. Um, this card is one of the best cards that we've had printed for Death and Taxes in the last five years easily. It is a removal spell on a body, and um, being able to take out any permanent that's not a land. So Planeswalkers is a big one. This often comes down and hits things like Renin Six. I've taken out Omnaths with it. I've taken out Jason Mind Sculptor with it. Three Mana to Fairy with it. Opposing creatures, and at the small cost of giving your opponent an Illusion token. That can be up to a 4-4, depending on what we remove with it. But a lot of the times, we'll just cast this, take out their biggest uh, problematic permanent, and then give them an illusion later on if they kill it, and then we'll remove their illusion with a Flicker Wisp trigger or something like that. Skyclave is incredible. Um, I mean, it, against decks like Hammer Time, it takes out their hammers. It takes out their Cigar to Zade. It takes out... A lot of the problematic permanents there. It eats Kroxas for dinner. Um, takes out, you know, a lot of the problem permanents in the format. Um, there are very few permanents that get above Skyclave range. And for those, we have our next card. And that is a full four of Solitude. This is the other best white card that we've gotten in a long, long time. Um, having Swords to Plowshares in Modern is very good, very important. It definitely gives Death and Taxes a huge boost, being able to exile and um, avoid things that like synergize with graveyards and stuff like that is very good too. This takes out big Emrakuls, even though there's not a ton of 15 mana Emrakuls in the format. It does take it out. It takes out 13 mana Emrakuls. It takes out Worm Coil Engines. It takes out everything that you want to take out in the format basically um cards incredible the fact that we can play it for free means that we can continue committing to the board and then as long as we hold back a white card or even put yorian in our hand to have to pitch to it in games where we want to do that it's incredible card is great and i don't think taxes is as good as it is right now without solitude then i do have a one of here um, this was the card that I trimmed one of the Charming Princes for, and that is Timeless Dragon. This card has overperformed um, in this deck since I've been playing it. It, on its, like, floor, just goes and fixes your mana. It gets you another land drop um, with the Plane Cycling ability. And then it could just stick around in your graveyard until you need another threat. And then you can Eternalize it, get a 4-4 Black Flying Dragon... Um, for four mana, which is a pretty decent rate, especially as something that just sits in your graveyard and you can get value out of later. And then there are games where I don't need to plane cycle it and I don't really feel like eternalizing it. So we could just vial it in because our vials go up to five now in Death and Taxes with Solitude and Yorian that I've just vialed in a five, five flying dragon and have ambushed things or finished off opponents where I can end step vial it in and finish up with the remaining five damage. And then, so that's our full creature suite. Um, 
So then we have the few spells that we get to play that aren't creatures in Death and Taxes. Of course, we're on four Ether Vials. This is kind of what allows us to gain card advantage and cheat on mana and allows us to essentially overrun our opponents with taxing effects. Uh, getting down a vial on turn one is still very, very good. And in the 80 card version of the deck, we see that less often, but we also have way more one drops now to put out on turn one. So it does kind of make up for it that we have more one drops. Ether Vial is still very, very powerful, so we keep them in the deck as a four of. And then we have four of Ephemerate. This card is insanely good in this deck. Um, we have a lot of ETB effects. The Flicker Wisp, the Skyclave Apparitions, the Solitudes, the Stoneforge Mystics, the Charming Princes, all of those cards do something when they come into play. So the ability to exile them quickly and return them immediately to play um, and then get a rebound trigger. There are tricks that we could do with this card where we evoke a solitude and then with the sacrifice trigger on the stack from evoke, we can ephemerate the solitude. It blinks and gets to kill another thing and then stays in play. That is one of the better lines with this card. And a lot of the time, if we're not grinding value out of it, we could just use this to blank removal spells. If somebody points a lightning bolt at a Thalia and we have the mana up for this, we could ephemerate it, save our Thalia, and blank their removal. I've done that countless times. It's very, very frustrating for people to try to kill your threats, and then you're just like, nope, and you blink it, and then you have it right back in play, and then you get to rebound it on your next upkeep and get to maybe get more value out of blinking something else. So the card is insanely good in this deck. It is a four of. It's rare that we get to play an instant in our Thalia deck, but it is absolutely worth playing as a four of. There's never been a time where I've had a creature in play and an ephemerate in my hand and have been sad about it. Then we have the equipment package for Stoneforge Mystic. You've already seen Lion Sash as the first equipment. Then we have Shadow Spear. This equipment is very, very good. It allows us to grind with aggressive matchups um, to be able to extend our life total. It also gets tutored off of Urza Saga and Stoneforge, so we have eight ways to find it and get it into play um, reasonably quickly. There are a lot of times that I will use the Stoneforge trigger to go get the Shadow Spear in a pinch when my life total is being threatened quickly and I have the mana just to jam it in play and put it onto something and try to get some life back. Um, otherwise, it is the best target that we have in our main deck for the Urza Saga trigger to come off of, so I'm happy to have it here. I am still playing a one of Sword and Fire and Ice in Death and Taxes in Modern. This card is less crucial than it used to be. It is less important than it used to be, but there are still matchups where this card is an absolute house and crushes. Um, the, the upside of it is there's matchups where your opponents are playing things like Fury and Brazen Borrower and Bone Crusher Giant and having protection from blue and red is very, very good. I played against the four color money pile deck um, very recently where my opponent's threats were literally their Yorian, a Fury, a Ice Fang Quaddle, and an Omnath. And I was able to suit up a Construct token with my Sword of Fire and Ice and just bash through all of their blockers because pro blue and pro red are very good. And then the trigger allows us to draw more cards in this deck, which is always a welcome addition to a Death and Taxes deck where we don't get to draw cards. We don't get a lot of raw, raw card drawing. So we have that. And then we have Batter Skull, which is classic Death and Taxes equipment. Um, this card is very, very, very solid. It allows us to outrace the aggro matchups. It is the go-to equipment when we are being, when our life total is being threatened and we need another threat. Um, a lot of the times 
if I am kind of threat light and I only have a Stoneforge Mystic and I'm not trying to be aggressive and end the game quickly, but I need the life total, Batter Skull's the go-to. And then we have Cauldra Complete, which is another newer equipment. And this equipment allowed us to close games very quickly, where previously we did not have the ability to close games the way that we uh, should have or the way that we've needed to before. Um, going turn two Stoneforge, getting Cauldra Complete, especially if we have a Giver of Runes on one to protect the Stoneforge, allows us to slam a 5-5 with haste into play and just beat our opponents to death. It is very hard to deal with beyond like um, the new white X removal spell, March, and the Prismatic ending. It's very difficult to deal with this. Um, having Indestructible and the Germ Token having Indestructible it just crushes opponents. Um, so that's been very, very good. That is the creatures and spells of the main deck. Now we'll go through the mana base. Being an 80 card deck, we have 32 lands and we'll start with our colorless utility lands. So we have four of Urza Saga. I've already talked about it a bit. This card allows us to play the game and to have value and to make threats just by making land drops. Um, making Construct Tokens are countless games where I just sit back and make Construct Tokens and beat my opponent's faces and with Constructs. Against Burn, where like an opponent sticks an Eidolon of the Great Revel, you don't have to cast anything if you have Urza Saga. You just make an Urza Saga, make a Construct. Make another Construct, go get your Shadow Spear, put it in play, equip it to your Construct, and now you are outracing Burn by a lot. Um... That or just getting an Aether Vial into play if we need one, if we already have the Shadow Spear or any number of our sideboard cards that we have that are tutorable with Urza Saga, which we'll go through later. This card is insanely powerful, but in a way that I think is very positive for every format that it's a part of, Legacy and Modern. This allows the decks that needed a little push over the top to get to a power level that still competes with the format but it doesn't break games. It is very beatable. There are a million answers to it in both Legacy and Modern, but it's still very, very powerful. And if it is unchecked, it will win games. Then we have four of Mishra's Factory as our next colorless utility land. Um, in control matchups where we're worried about sweepers and stuff like that, Mishra's Factory is very important. I always like having man lands in Death and Taxes. Usually in 60 card builds, it'll be a cute one of, but in 80 cards where we have the utility land spots and in a format like Modern where we don't have the really good lands like uh, Wasteland and Rashad Import, Mishra's Factory is absolutely welcome. Good utility land. And then we have four Field of Ruins. Because we want to disrupt our opponent's mana, there are decks that play with greedy mana bases in Modern, so some of the time it's a strip mine. A lot of the time it just takes out opposing Urza Sagas, it takes out things like Celestial Colonnades, other man lands, Tron lands. Tron is still a deck in the format that exists. Um, so Field of Ruin is very, very worth having. It's very good. We're not going on the full, like, screw your opponent out of their mana completely plan like the leon and arbiter 60 card builds are with ghost quarters and fields or tectonic edges um but we want to have the ability to do some of that so moving on from that we get to our colored lands i'm playing three of Igonjo, seat of the empire this is the new land from Kamigawa Neon Destiny. It is a legendary land. It taps for white. Um, that's not the important part. The important part is its channel ability. For two and a white, we could discard it and deal four damage to an attacking or blocking creature. And this ability costs one less for each legend we have in play. <coughs> Excuse me. So this card is a, another piece of removal built into our mana base. It's very good. There are cards that have protection from white, like Turok in the format, where previously, if Turok lands and all of our threats are white, we can't beat that card. We can't kill that card. So we have Igonjo now to take care of that. It also can take out bigger threats. 
um, combined with some blockers and stuff like that. It's just a nice piece of utility that also helps us make land drops or later in the game helps us kill a threat. And then we are on a full 17 basic planes. Um, our mana base is pretty stable. We have a lot of white sources. All of our lands come into play untapped, which is important to me. Um, in a lot of ways, it matters a ton to have your lands come into play so you cast your spells immediately and on curve. That's an important thing that Death and Taxes needs is to play on curve. So that is our mana base, and that's the entire main deck. We'll go through the sideboard quickly um, and talk about some of my choices. Of course, Yorian is in the sideboard technically. He is our companion. And then we have some cards that we're able to tutor up with Urza's Saga. The first of which is Relic of Progenitus. Having Graveyard Hate in this format is important. Things like Murktide Region, uh, Dragon's Reach Channeler, and just other decks that utilize the Graveyard are important. And our sideboard cards tend to be less effective in an 80 card build. So having cards that we're able to tutor with Urza Saga I think is very important. Our cards in our sideboard either have to be massive impact or be able to get tutored. And so Relic of, Relic of Progenitus is a way that we get Graveyard Hate that's tutorable, that we could board in easily. It's a one for one exchange um, and it's nice to have access to it. Another card that we can get off of Urza Saga is Pithing Needle. This card is very good in a world where Hammer Time exists where Planeswalkers exist and are very powerful. The ability to tutor it and stop a Renin Six or a Little Teferi or a Colossal Hammer um, or any number of other things with an activated ability. I brought, boarded this in against Elves and turned off Quirion Ranger um, as an example or um, Izuri or the new Elvish Warcaller. So like there are things that you wouldn't think about boarding Pithing Needle in for that it's still good against. And then I have a one of Graph Digger's Cage. This card has been really good. Um, there are some Elves decks at my local store. So this turning off Collected Company and Court of Calling is really, really good. Um, this also stops things like Living End. Um, and it turns off like even like snapcaster mage which you probably don't bring this in often against snapcaster decks but there is some utility there again tutoring with saga very good and then we have a good handful of removal spells we we're playing a two of portable hole this card's been very good um this is here mostly because in my local meta there are a bunch of hammer time decks i keep talking about that deck there is a lot of that deck around this stops their colossal hammers it stops their esper sentinels it takes out their ornithopters it takes out cigar to say basically every threat in their deck is going to cost two or less mana for the most part this is removal for anything in their deck um it's good against opposing aggro decks i bring it in against burn for the um the Roiling Vortex for their Eidolons, for their Goblin Guides, all their creatures and stuff get hit by it. I board it in against tribal decks like Spirits, um, things like that. So it's just versatile, good removal. It takes out a lot of permanence. Then we have two Path to Exiles. This card isn't what it used to be. There have been a lot better removal spells printed. Um, Prismatic Ending, which we don't have access to. The Mono White March is a card I might consider exchanging this with, but I like having access to Path to Exile. Sometimes you just need unconditional one mana removal for a creature. So I keep the paths here. Again, we don't want to give our opponent extra lands when we're a taxes deck. So that's why that this card used to be a four of in main decks of Death and Taxes. We've got some better removal now with Solitude and Skyclave, so we've moved it to the sideboard. Sometimes we just need more removal. Then we have some more Graveyard Hate. We're playing two Rest in Peace. Um, there are decks that lean heavily on the Graveyard. Murktide Regent decks and Dragon's Rage Chandler decks and decks that play Kroxa and Snapcaster decks and stuff like that are still a problem. 
decks that get value out of their graveyard and grind, we don't want to deal with. So in addition to the Relic of Progenitus, I have two rest in pieces here because it is a bomb of a sideboard card against graveyard based decks. And I still think it's worth having them around. Of course, we're going to see less of it when we have 80 cards, but that's why we're also playing the Relic Regenitus and we have the Lion Sash in the main deck. So this is just to maximize our graveyard hate. So instead of four wrestling pieces, we have a couple different versatile graveyard hate pieces, but we can get up to a full four pieces in the deck if we need to in games two and three. And then we have two of Kataki's War, Kataki Wars Wage. Um, I'm a deck that plays a lot of artifacts myself, so this isn't a free roll in our deck. However, again, there's a lot of Hammer Time around out there, and this card crushes Hammer Time. Their whole deck is made of artifacts, and there is still Affinity decks that exist out there, so this is a card that I wanted access to. It's not tutorable in this deck, so I'm playing two of them instead of a spicy one of. But in games where I need it, it is very good, and it is part of an entire package of cards I bring in for Hammer Time with the portable holes, with the Path to Exiles, and so I need to max out on ways to interact with them, and this is one of the best ways in the format to interact with them. Then, speaking of Hammer Time, we have a one of Manriki Gasari. I keep saying that there's a lot of Hammer Time out there, especially in my local me uh, meta, and this is a tutorable way to destroy Colossal Hammer over and over and over again. It is hard for your opponents to interact with, so I play it as a one of in my Stoneforge deck to be able to go get it and kill opposing equipments. And there are worlds where you have this in play and you have a um, Shadow Spear, and you can activate the Shadow Spear to take away Indestructible from opposing Cauldron Completes and destroy Cauldron Complete. So. It's versatile in very specific matchups. Um, I'm playing a one of Oriok Champion. There was a slot that I didn't know what to play. And so I was like, I have always liked having access to a card that's good against mono red. And this card is also good against black red decks or Jund decks some of the time. And it also has some weird utility. I boarded this in against elves the other day and just gaining one life off of every elf that they put into play was really, really good. It was really, really effective, and it put me ahead on life so I could survive while I find my answers to, like, find my Skyclaves and other stuff to take out their elves. It also, in that matchup, just blocks their uh, Shaman of the Packs endlessly. So it does have utility that you wouldn't think of. So for that reason, it is a card that I put in of uh, one of in my flex slot. And then I have the fourth Archon of Iberia. This card is really good when it's really good, so I wanted access to four, but I can't justify four in the main deck, and this was just kind of the last sideboard slot decision that I've made, and I've been very happy with it there. It gets boarded in quite a bit. Oftentimes, even when it's not the most impactful card in a matchup, <coughs> I'll board it in because I have to trim something else. And having a 2-3 flying body is not that big of a deal. Like, it's not that bad of an option to have. It has a relevant body. It has relevant abilities. Sometimes I got to trim something that's just not going to be good. Like, sometimes Sword of Fire and Ice just isn't it for that a specific matchup. Um, so I need something else to bring in. And there's not necessarily something else on my sideboard that makes sense. So here's just another body as an easy exchange to get something out of my deck that I need out of my deck. So that is the entire deck. And like I said, I've been having some success with it lately. I plan on continuing to grind with it and tune it and adjust it, but I'm really happy with where the build is at right now in this current meta. Um, with the qualifiers coming up, I'm probably going to be playing taxes through some number of them. Um, I have the option to borrow other decks to play and can play one of the top decks in the format if I wanted to. But honestly, I'm the most comfortable playing modern when I'm playing my deck and when I'm playing Death and Taxes because the deck just feels solid right now. 
It feels underrepresented. It feels very, very good and very powerful and underrated. Not a lot of people are ready to play against Death and Taxes. Um, so the plan is to know my deck better than my opponents know theirs. And oftentimes when you play in qualifiers or more serious competitive tournaments, you run into a bunch of people just trying to play the best deck and you'll run into players that don't play the deck that they found on MTG Goldfish at the top of the list of modern. They don't play it optimally and they don't play it as well as somebody play would play a deck of theirs that they've been playing for years. I've been playing Death and Taxes for a long time. So I decided to continue working on the deck and it's been paying dividends and I look forward to grinding more with it. If you have any questions about the deck, let me know in the comments down below. I will be posting a list in the uh, information of the video and I hope that that's been helpful. If you have any questions or comments or any ideas for the deck, please drop me a line and let me know and I'll be glad to talk about taxes with anybody who would like to. That's all I've got and I'll talk to you soon.